Hi friends, this is Jenny from Narrate. This past weekend was the final part of Narrate's series, The Burden of Power. Josh talked about the dynamics of exploiting power. Enjoy! For those of you who are guests with us, my name is Josh. And, and uh, you know, welcome to Narrate. We recognize that coming to a church for the first time isn't necessarily an easy thing to do. That coming into a building in which you don't know many, if any, people at all uh, isn't an easy thing to do. And so, so thanks and, and welcome. For the past few weeks, we've been having this conversation called the burden of power. And really what we've been discussing in it are the dynamics of power. Now, power is, is a, such a negative buzzword because there are so many examples in the world we live in of people taking power and exploiting it for their own benefit with total neglect of what other people need. I'm just going to move this a little bit. Sorry. So with that said, though, what if power isn't all that bad? And what if we are also made for it? Um, What if we are made to have an ability to affect other people's well-being? And and that can be on a significant level for leaders and so on, but also for people in individual relationships. With two people interacting with one another, there is a component of power. But what if in order to not exploit that power, that influence that you have over, over another individual... We need to be continually stepping into vulnerability in that relationship. And if we don't, it's exploitation and controlling and manipulation and so on. Now, today we're going to talk about that exploitation specifically and how we ourselves can get caught in the trap of exploiting power or how we can be caught in the trap of allowing someone to exploit power over us. I have a great deal of experience with this because I have been gifted with the opportunity to be an older brother. (laughs) And so I've had the opportunity to exploit my power in all kinds of fun, creative ways. My brother is eight years younger than me, significantly younger than me. Uh, And so really for the past three years, we've had more of an adult-to-adult relationship. But the 19 years previous to that... Um, it was more of a babysitter dynamic. And that's not a comment on his maturity at all. That's just the fact that he was eight years developmentally behind him. Whenever I was 16 years old, he was only eight. And so um, in large part, being this kind of pseudo babysitter for my little brother, uh, I tried hard to be a good brother to him and and take care of him and be kind to him uh, and take him out to have fun and so on. But every so often, I just tried to spice it up a little bit. Uh, and so just to give a couple of examples, I remember one that was really fun, and it was a, it was a lengthy, several-month-long process. He was really into that show Spy Kids. Are you guys familiar with that show on Disney Channel? A couple of you, maybe? So really what it is is it's, it's like the go-go gadget of... Uh, it's the newer go-go gadget, uh, gadget man, whatever, but this, this family, particularly these couple of kids in this family who are in fact spies and they have all these cool gadgets. And Timmy thought that that was just, his name's Tim. Timmy thought that was just the coolest thing and and that's what he wanted to be. And so I slowly started to convince him that I was in fact a spy and that our family was merely a cover-up. And anytime that I was gone for a weekend or for a week of camp or something like that, I would convince him that I was actually going to be trained, uh, getting more training or on a mission And it just slowly started with, Timmy, you know, I'm actually a spy. And he just slowly started to believe in it and started to have this bitterness and jealousy toward me. And I remember one time, like, he was trying to fight me. And, you know, he's much younger and smaller than I am. So I'm just blocking every punch that he's throwing. Like, see, like, I have all the training. I'm a spy. (laughs) But I had a lot of fun with that. But probably my favorite example of me being uh, a a jerk older brother, was we uh, were on on family vacation. And how this vacation played out is my mom and my brother and I, we went down to Texas, which is where we're from, and spent a lot of time with extended family. We were down there for about a month. Uh, And over the course uh, of that month, we spent time with several family members, and we also went to a theme park a couple of times, Six Flags over Texas, Huge theme park, 
all kinds of roller coasters and so on, had a ton of fun. Um, and then in the third week of that month, my dad came down and spent some time with our family, and then we all started driving back to Idaho, which is where we lived at the time. And on the way back, my dad likes to make road trips into adventures, and so is there a spot where I should stand? And maybe someone can help you guys find a seat. You're looking for a seat, maybe? Oh, okay. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, my dad likes to make road trips and two adventures, and so we stopped at the Badlands in South Dakota, and we spent a couple of days there. Super cool place, just awesome. And uh, at the Badlands, there was this tourist shop that offered helicopter rides over the Badlands, um, and, you know, it's just an outrageously expensive price. You can get, you know, a five-minute ride for $30,000. Uh, and so my family and I, we decided, hey, that's something that we could do. And so we went to the shop, and we started filling out all of the information. And my mom and my brother are in the back of the shop, and I'm in the front of the shop uh, with my dad. And remember, we had gone to this theme park a couple of times. And Timmy, at this point, he was addicted to thrill. He's a mountaineering guide now, so he must be addicted to thrill and also misery and cold. But anyway, at or he's just thrilled about this um, opportunity too. But there was a dynamic there because of the theme parks that we were at. And, and the theme parks, you had to be a certain height to ride on certain roller coasters. You had to be like 52 inches to ride on certain roller coasters. And Timmy was not quite tall enough for some of them. He was like 49 inches. But he still had several roller coasters that he could ride. So, uh, you know, he, it was okay and it worked out for him. But then uh, at this helicopter shop, there was no height requirement. But I decided to communicate to him. I said, hey, Timmy. And I leaned back in the tourist shop and said, Timmy, you've got to be 52 inches. It looks like it's just going to be dad, mom, and me flying in the helicopter, and you're going to have to stay here. And he just broke down in the middle of the shop, and everyone is staring at us. And my mom and my dad are planning a means of murdering me later. <laughs> but a few hours later, my dad did say, Josh, that was awesome. <laughs> so anyway... He did get to ride the helicopter, and it was super fun, and we spent our 30 grand for five minutes of, you know, okay views, but <laughs> it was a fun time. Now, that's a fun example of exploitation of power, right? But we live in a world in which exploitation of power negatively affects people in very real ways. I mean, there's the global phenomenons like child labor and so on that is affecting a great deal of kids, sex trafficking is exploitation of power. Political leaders who use their power negatively. But then if power exists in those closer relationships as well, those closer, more normalized relationships as well, then exploitation can happen in those too. Whether it's in a marriage in which one spouse has a certain amount of power over another spouse and acts out manipulative, manipulatively toward that other individual. Or in the family, you see stories uh, or, or you hear stories or make observations of a parent that controls their kids, does not allow for vulnerability and gives their kids options and choices and so on and therefore opens themselves up to perhaps things going well but also opens themselves up to perhaps rejection and things not going well either. But some parents opt for not having vulnerability and controlling their children, or vice versa. It's definitely not just that way. Kids can also control their parents, too. As a single millennial, I see it happen over and over again in people's dating relationships. One person has a certain power over another person. Usually it involves one person has uh, less affection for that other, pers other person, and in that, oftentimes, what happens is some form of a manipulation. And that one person who is getting manipulated is willing to keep the relationship intact because it's a relationship. And so they sacrifice themselves or hurt themselves in that. Exploitation of power is very real in the world that we live in. It's also very real in the Bible. Story after story after story, there's leaders and individuals and characters 
who abuse their power, who exploit their power and hurt people in the process. One of the people I'd like to talk to about specifically today is a man by the name of Solomon. Solomon was the third king of Israel. And so first there was Saul and then there was David. And David was a remarkable leader of the people of Israel, very well respected, high in favor with the people of Israel, high in favor with God. And Solomon was David's son. And so he started up his leadership, started off with a great deal of favor from God and people. And during his tenure, during his reign as king, one of his primary objectives was to build a temple. And this was a huge part of Israel's identity because in this temple, this is where God would dwell. This is where God would be near them as a people. And so it was a big part of their identity, a big part of their hope, of their peace. Solomon builds this temple and then he dedicates it to God. And then God appears to Solomon. The Bible says that God appeared to Solomon and shared with him a promise. And this promise is really two-sided. And really, essentially what it is, is lead with integrity, and things will go well for you in your kingdom. Don't lead with integrity, and things won't. It's in 1 Kings chapter 9. And it goes like this. This is God speaking to Solomon. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. And here's the negative part. But if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, Then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And this temple will become a heap of rubble. And all who pass by it will be appalled and will scoff and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? And people will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord their God who brought their ancestors out of Egypt. And have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving him. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. Beautiful promise, followed by a very dark promise. Now, Solomon, in very large part, was an incredible leader. The Bible claims him to be the wisest man who ever lived. But he did make some decisions that ended up negatively affecting himself and the kingdom that he led. And it starts off in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. We see an example of this decision that he made, and then he made a series of other decisions just like it. It says this, that Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. The ESV would say, the ESV version of the Bible would say that Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, or with Pharaoh's daughter, rather. Now, This was Solomon's foreign policy. If he could marry a foreign leader or a relative or a close person to a foreign leader, then people, the people of Israel would stay safe because it was a form of an alliance in this time period. And so this is his foreign policy. And so he looks at another country, not just Egypt. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll marry this person and another one and another one and another one. And it goes on with this, this cycle of decisions of marrying into a host of relationships. He's attempting to control his kingdom, control the circumstances of his kingdom through this foreign policy technique. It says in chapter 11, the end result of all of this work that he had done, it says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love, and he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, uh, insert uh, farming equipment joke, uh, and his wives led him astray. 
Solomon, his foreign policy was sex, essentially. But can we really blame him? He was attempting, really what he was doing was he was trying to keep himself and the kingdom that he led safe. And a means of doing that was through these marriage alliances. Yeah, God warned him against it. But it seemed like a reasonable avenue toward keeping his community, his people safe. We've been talking a great deal about this book called Strong and Weak in this series. And it's by a guy named Andy Crouch. And on a particular chapter within this book that deals with the exploitation of power, there's a couple of quotes. He did not speak to Solomon specifically. This was just kind of drawn from my own personal reading. But he, he, he made a couple of quotes in this chapter on the exploitation of power that seemed to really tap in to what Solomon was experiencing, what Solomon was living out during his reign. One of those is this. The church once enumerated seven deadly sins, lust, gluttony, greed, all of which Solomon was obviously uh, guilty of, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. Most of them are ways of pursuing authority without vulnerability. And then continuing on just a few pages later in the chapter, they offer us in a word, control. For the very vulnerability Uh, For the very essence of control is authority without vulnerability, the ability to act without the possibility of loss. God had communicated to Solomon, trust me, trust me. I know that there's this thing called marriage alliances that exist in the world that you lived in at that time period, but trust me, don't enter into those relationships. Lead with integrity, and it will end well for you. Solomon was attempting to control his circumstances, right? And in the process, he lost control of himself. Just really the question I have is, is what if Solomon's attempt to control circumstances, or that is to say exploitation of power, led to his losing control of himself and his kingdom? He did not allow himself to become vulnerable to the possibilities that could have happened without these marriage alliances But in that, he ultimately lost control of himself and his kingdom. Guys, this reminds me so much of my own story. When I was a kid, a young kid, an adolescent, uh, we we moved around a lot. In fact, I went to 11 schools from K through 12. That's a lot of loss for a boy. And, And in that... I would develop friendships, develop community, and so on, and then it would be ripped from me again. And develop friendships and develop community again, and once again, it would be ripped from me. Uh, To the point to where, you know, friendships were, were, were fairly difficult for me. And we actually ended up moving to Helena, uh, for the latter part of my high school career. And so I finished up my high school career at Helena High. And, uh, you know, graduated and then was going to start going to college and was really excited about college because for the first time in my life, I was going to be a freshman that was looking for friends surrounded by a lot of other freshmen that were also looking for, for friends. It was going to be so much different than what my previous experiences were, where I was the, 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 really the loner, the, 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 um, the new kid on the block trying to enter into different friend communities, friend groups, and so on. But naturally, it's hard to do that, especially for a shy kid like I was. And so I was thrilled to go to college. And on top of that, this this was a Christian college. And so I was excited to finally go to a school in which most all really people claim to have a similar worldview to me. And so that's not to say that over K through 12, I didn't have friendships. I definitely did. But I'd always had a relational cup that was not full in college as my opportunity to finally get it full. And in large part, that's what happened. Uh, I started to really click with several people, and it was excellent, and, and I loved it, and it was truly soothing to my heart and soul. But there were certain relationships that required a level of vulnerability. It could have been a dating relationship. It could have been a closer friendship. And that certain level of vulnerability would cause me to just kind of back up 
to kind of back away because it was something that I was so unused to. And it's a pattern that I observed in my own life, and so I started to seek therapy for it. And therapists really were just like, oh, well, you just have an attachment disorder because you've never known closeness. You've never known safety. And whenever you get a taste of it, you don't know what to do with it. It's like a dog that catches a car. It's like, okay, what do I do now? You know, And that's kind of where I was at in these relationships. And I would move toward things that I could control. I couldn't control these people whom I was close to. But I would move toward things that I could control. And, 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 and just an array of addictions. One of them uh, is, is really pretty on the outside. You know, I'm going to pursue a 4.0 GPA and step away from friendships in the name of homework. Or I'm going to pursue volunteering and doing great things for God and step away from the vulnerability that God has made me for. Or in dating relationships, I'm going to step away from this real woman that is sitting across from this table with me and enter into a relationship with a girl on a computer screen where there's no vulnerability and I have absolute control. And man, it caused a lot of pain for me and a lot of work to get better and well. Now, a therapist has helped me actually fairly recently being gracious toward myself and saying, Josh, you're just looking for safety. And because you have not experienced much nearness or rather didn't experience much nearness in your childhood and in your adolescence, whenever you experience now, you distrust whether or not that relationship is going to be safe for you. Was that not what Solomon was doing? He was just looking for safety as he led the people of Israel, as he was king. Safety for himself and the people whom he led. Is that not what I'm looking for? Or particularly was looking for was some form of safety. And anytime a nearness would happen, I would move toward things that I could control because that's what seemed safest. Is that not what's happening in certain relationship dynamics, whether it's in a married couple and one person in that couple has wants and desires and needs and looks for the safest means for getting those things achieved, done, existent in their marriage? Is that not what a parent does whenever they're interacting with her kid? Kids, you know, parents at least in the community that we live in, it seems like to me that most parents approach their kids with as pure of hearts as could be. They just want nothing but good for them. But unfortunately, sometimes control is the option that is chosen in getting that good for them rather than the vulnerability of like, okay, here's your options. And it might involve acceptance, but it might also involve risk and loss Rejection. Jesus is the polar opposite of this. Jesus had absolute power. But even someone who had absolute power was willing to submit himself to people and allow people to choose for themselves whether they would accept him or reject him. And can you imagine that for Jesus in leading people, Understanding that to follow the way, to follow him, is the absolute best, most peaceful way to live. That for people to reject him, it's not only the pain of him getting rejected, it's the pain of understanding that they're choosing a certain path that is not going to be good for them. But even still, Jesus, who had all the power anyone could ever have, stepped in to vulnerability. So the relationships that you all have, whether it's with a friend, a coworker, a boss, an employee, a mom, a dad, a kid, a teenager, think about what are you wanting in that relationship? And what if you pursued what you wanted in that relationship? 
with as much vulnerability as you can muster. Because the other option is control. And it never helps you. And it never helps the person whom you're trying to help out and influence. Can we pray really quick? God, thanks so much for uh, your grace. Thanks for your example in Jesus of someone whom had all power but was willing to submit himself to people's decision making whether that involved acceptance and joy and peace or rejection and heartbreak and pain God as we interact with the people whom we love whom we care for I pray God that we would Share with them a vulnerability. It's risky. But God, we ask that you give us the capacity to trust people. And also give us the capacity to trust you. And if it's supposed to work out, it will. Thank you that we are whole in you, God. We love you. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.